Hello and a very good morning to one and all joining with us on this lovely Sunday morning. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been joined by the very renowned and the very energetic Dr. Akshay Kumar Swami. Sir, I welcome you on the behalf of the entire team of World Implant Expo. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Akshay completed his Bachelor's of Dental Surgery in the year 2006 from the College of Dental Sciences, Davangiri, Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bangalore. From there on, he attained the Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies in General Dentistry in the year 2008 from the Boston University Goldman School of Dental Medicine, Boston, USA. He completed his master's in periodontics in the year 2011 from the University of North Carolina at the Chapel Hill School of Dentistry, North Carolina, USA. He will also be adding to the value and validation of the World Implant Expo in Kochi later this year. So it's wonderful to have you on board and I'm sure everybody is looking forward to learning from you. Thank you so much, Aditi. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning from a rainy morning here in Mumbai. We are all gearing up for uh, the long five-day holiday of Ganesh Chaturthi that is coming up. So uh, I think uh, this will be a good head start. Uh, I finish the webinar work tomorrow and then uh, take a few days off. So um, again, when I was given this topic uh, by Dr. Shankar Ayer, again, thanks to him for organizing this conference. I'm so looking forward to uh, being there in Kochi, seeing all of you, meeting all of you, collaborating with all of you. Um, I think all these conferences are uh, such a good avenue for discussions, exchange of ideas. So uh, I am really looking forward to the end of November. Uh, so today's topic, uh, again, suturing in implant dentistry doesn't uh, differ much from what suturing uh, is with regular dentistry. But uh, again, I think it's an important aspect that we all need to uh, remember. So we'll try to go over uh, some of that uh, aspect of suturing. So uh, let me begin. I'm just trying to get my... Uh, annotate here, uh, let me just see. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, there you go. So what's the rationale? Uh, again, we are going to discuss these topics, the rationale for suturing, suture materials, resorbable versus non-resorbable. I'm going to talk about the different surgical threads and needles that uh, we see uh, in dentistry, and also the type of suturing techniques. I'm going to end my presentation with a few cases, a case videos that I would want you to see about uh, uh, suturing, which I think will benefit you in your uh, daily practice. So what is the rationale for suturing? One of the main things is the flap edges should be held in apposition until the wound heals and withstands the normal functional stresses. Now, most often uh, we, of course, give up our patient sutures. One of the main instructions that I give my patients is not to move their tongue in that area. I don't want anything to go in the area of my sutures. It is a natural tendency for patients to move their tongue in the area. So please let them know beforehand that their tongue should not go there. They should not pick with their fingers. All of these you must have heard in your practice. And if you have not, then you will be hearing it in future in your practice. So these are the normal things where the flap edges should be held in that position and the sutures need to be there for that until the area heals. So usually for about uh, seven to 10 days. Uh, accurate apposition, why is it important? Patient comfort. If we leave a flap open, the bone underneath is bare and that can cause a lot of pain. It is very similar to the pain that is encountered in a patient who has a dry socket. We all know the reason why a dry socket happens is the bare bone is exposed. There is no blood clot that is formed. That's the same thing that happens when a flap is not enclosed or closed properly after a procedure. We also hope for reduction in wound size. Uh, if we all know about wound healing, as soon as the wound healing starts, the area swells up. The reason being blood rushes into the area, the flap is swollen up, and then slowly once the clot forms, the wound healing cascade uh, is uh, going on, then slowly the wound reduces in size or the, or the flap wound shrinks in size. So we want that to happen. The flaps, uh, the sutures will hold the flap in place while the entire wound healing process is going on. 
Also prevention of bone loss. Now, always remember that whenever a flap is reflected, there is a minimal amount of bone loss that happens at the crestal level of the flap. So that is the reason why once you're experienced enough uh, in implant dentistry, and when I'm talking about experience, I'm talking about at least about 100, 200 implants have been placed. You are then comfortable doing flapless surgery, which in turn will reduce the amount of bone loss that happens. Also, it will make sure the patient comfort is so much uh, better as compared to when you open a flap. But again, for beginners, I would not advise this. You have to gain a lot of experience raising flaps, placing implants, and only once you know the anatomy of the area, would you be moving on to what we call as flapless implantology. And finally, flap edges should be held in a position to, for hemostasis. We all know you leave a flap open, it keeps bleeding. So we need to make sure that the flap is closed with sutures so that there is hemostasis in the area. Well, if hemostasis is not controlled, blood and serum accumulate under the flap and the wound healing is delayed. So one tip that I can give you here is as soon as you suture your flaps up, take two wet pieces of gauze, hydrate them in saline, hold one on the buckle, one on the lingual, give some pressure towards the bone, towards the flap, and press it in place and hold it in place for at least about two minutes. This will ensure the first blood clot is formed in close apposition between the flap and the bone, and there's no space that is given. So always do that as soon as you finish suturing, make sure that you press, give some compression with some gauze over the flap, gentle compression. Of course, I would not advise this after a GBR procedure. I'm talking about a normal flap procedure, normal flap elevation for implant placement, close it, hold it in place, and that will give you a good amount of apposition that is required. What are the major principles that you should follow in suturing? Now, sutures should always be placed distal to the last tooth in each interproximal space and then go in a mesial direction. Now, when you start uh, surgeries, uh, let's say either a periodontal flap surgery or an implant surgery, one tends to be very conservative. You tend to open up small flaps. You are scared of opening flaps. The best way to start practicing raising flaps is to start doing them before extractions. When you know a patient needs an extraction, go ahead and raise flaps, extract the tooth, even though the teeth may not require a flap elevation. Go ahead and do that so you can practice two things, flap elevation and suturing techniques. These are the two things that you can practice whenever you extract a tooth. So go ahead and raise a flap, raise a flap where the flap extends one tooth on either side, extract the tooth, close the flap, give sutures. So I think this is the best way to start practicing uh, suturing. Uh, in a patient's mouth. Sutures should always be inserted through the more mobile flap first. Most often that is the buckle flap. The reason being you are have access, much more access to the buckle flap than the lingual. So you tend to raise that more. So always insert your suture from the buckle flap first and then the uh, next one would be your lingual flap as much as possible. Now, where do you grab the needle? Grab the suture needle about three-fourth way down, closer to the swage of the needle. I'll come to the parts of the needle, but just for this uh, image right here, the needle point, then you have the body, and the swage is where the suture thread connects to the needle. So hold it about three-fourth way down or one-fourth way closer to where the swage of the needle is. So that way you will get a good amount of uh, bite on the tissue when you hold your suture needle uh, three-fourth way down, closer to the swage of the needle. The needle should enter at right angles to the tissue. So you can see in this image, it is right under the papilla at right angles with a good amount of bite there. And that's the next point we'll talk about. But entering the flap or entering the tissue at 90 degrees is very important. If you enter at any other angle, you may end up tearing the flap. So always make sure you have a good bite and a good angle while penetrating through the tissues. Again, sutures should be placed no closer than two to three millimeters from the edge of the flap to prevent flap tear while suturing, as I mentioned. So make sure you have what we call as a good bite into the tissue when suturing. The flaps should be approximated without blanching when suturing, which is what we call as a tension-free flap closure. Now, I like to uh, give an analogy here. Uh, your sutures are not your nada of the pajamas. You're not going to use them to tie tightly, okay? 
Your flap has to be passive. Your sutures are just holding the flap in place. So please remember this analogy. Don't try to tight it too tight because then you will compromise the blood supply of the flap. Okay. And then you pull the suture tight enough to secure the flap in place without restricting the flap's blood supply. Again, do not rely on your sutures to pull the flap beyond its passive positioning. Same analogy as I mentioned of the Nada. Okay, do not pull it beyond its passive positioning. You cannot pull a flap with a suture hoping that it will cover that area. Your flap has to be in the position that you want it finally, and then you're suturing it to hold it in place. Now remember, tension from suturing will potentially interfere with the blood supply, increases the likelihood of the sutures spilling through the tissues, tearing through the tissues, which hinders the wound stability. Most often, if you see your papillary area, if you are losing bone or the papillary tissue, that is because of your sutures being too tight in that area. So make sure you're not doing that. Okay, so you do not want necrosis of the marginal portion of the flap. Now, what is my armamentarium? I have my con suture pliers. I have my tissue pliers, which come in different forms, and I'll discuss that. Castro Viejo needle holder. I just love that instrument. And uh, finally, the scissors, which also exist in a Castro Viejo uh, model. So I'll go through all of that. Now, these are my uh, con pliers. Again, these are the con suture pliers. So if you see at the end, there's a small hole. That is for passing your needle through that. So this serves a dual purpose. You're holding your tissue with it and passing through your needle through these con suture pliers. So make sure you have this in your armamentarium. Tissue forceps, there are three kinds of tissue forceps that exist. Uh, the first one is a plain tip. There is no teeth, it limits control. You will always find with the top one that your tissue slips from underneath. So I barely use it, I don't use it at all. I use what is called as a one by two tip, which has a single tooth, which can be used to hold the tissues. But again, they may pierce delicate tissues. So if you're dealing with tissues which have what we call as a thin biotype, a thin biotype tissue, you do not want to use the second one because it will pierce through the tissue. The third one with the multiple teeth is the preferred tissue pickup because you can see they have a serrated teeth as well as something with the first one has. So it gives a dual control. You can hold the tissue while you're trying to suture the area. So a very important aspect of tissue forceps, make sure you choose the right one. How do you hold a needle holder? You always hold the needle holder with your thumb and ring finger inserted through the rings. Your index finger will be along the length so it can guide the needle holder. The middle finger aids in controlling the locking mechanism so you can lock and unlock using that middle finger. So always make sure you use this. Best way to practice, again, you take a sponge or you take a banana, you can take any of the suturing methods that are there to practice your suturing before you go on and practice it on a patient. Now, as I mentioned, you have a Castro Viejo needle holder. This is one of the best instruments that uh, we have encountered. Again, I love this instrument. One of the main things to use this instrument, you have to use a needle which is smaller, thinner, and a suture material which is thinner. So for example, I use a Castro Viejo needle holder only for sutures 5O and above. You also have to use some amount of magnification to use this. So I use my loops that I uh, usually use with my Castro Viejo needle holder, but do not use a Castro Viejo needle holder with sutures less than 5 0. That is, do not use it with a 3 0, 4 0. You'll, you'll end up breaking the hinge or the hinge of the needle holder will get spoiled. So don't do that. And finally, you have a Castro Viejo suture cutting scissors. Again, please uh, invest in one of these. These are the best. You don't want big uh, sutures going into a patient's mouth. They are already scared. Uh, for those of you here who have experienced a lot of patients, when you talk to them about them coming back, uh, one of their first questions is, are the sutures resolvable? And if you tell them, no, it is non-resolvable, they are going to ask you if it's going to pay. So those are two questions that they're going to ask. So when they come back for suture removal, please don't introduce a big fat needle, uh, big fat scissor to try and cut that. Use something smaller like this, which uh, is easy on them and they're not too scared to come back for uh, getting their sutures cut. What are the suture materials? What are we looking at in these suture materials? We want to look at the suture thread qualities. We want to have a 
good tensile strength for appropriate use. We want them to be biocompatible with the tissue. We also want an ease of tying and allowance of minimal knot slippage. They should not untie themselves when we give these sutures. What are the selection criteria? Again, based on tissue type, tension-free areas that you would uh, want. Suture should retain its strength until the tissues of the surgical flap regain the sufficient strength to keep the wound edges together. So usually that happens over the first seven to 10 days. So most often than not, you would want to see your patients after the seven day mark. So anytime between the first to second week is an ideal time to get your patients back to cut the sutures off. Have I waited longer? Yes, many times if in case my area is still healing, the times that I have waited is in GBR procedures. So when I know that the tissue is still healing, I may wait uh, longer to cut the sutures off or I may give resorbable sutures which have an extended uh, half-life where the resorption takes place over a month or so. Now, what are the different kinds of suture materials that we see? We see absorbable and non-absorbable. That's the first uh, differentiating factor. In absorbable, you have your natural and synthetic. In natural, you have your cat cut, collagen, cargyle membrane, kangaroo tendon, and fascia lata. In dentistry, we mainly use only cat cut as a natural absorbable suture material. In synthetic absorbables, you have your polyglycolic acid, micril, which is widely used. We also have polydioxanone, not much in use. And of course, you have your polytrimethylene carbonate, again, not much in use. So main thing in a synthetic absorbable suture material that we use is our vital sutures. Coming to the non-absorbable side, natural, of course, universally used silk is what we have used. In the synthetic aspect, you have your nylon, polypropylene or your proline sutures, your braided polyesters and polybutester. The ones that we use in dentistry mainly are your proline or polypropylene and sometimes your braided polyesters as well. Sorry, one. let me just... Okay. Um... I'm trying to see how. Sir, I... you can unshare and reshare again. Unshare and reshare again? Okay. Yeah. Let me just do that. Oh, now it's working. Okay. So, what are the different uh, suture materials? Again, this table is something that you would want to uh, maybe uh, copy paste and keep it uh, for future reference. We start with the surgical gut, as I mentioned, a natural absorbable extraction uh, suture mainly that is used. Size comes in a 3 year It has a cutting needle. It is completely digested by 70 days. Effective strength for about two to three days. So I have uh, seen surgical gut stay for a little longer. Uh, the next one that is chromic gut stays for much lesser. Again, if the suture stays for too long, also it's a problem. It can attract plaque. It can cause a lot of issues, can cause infections. So you don't want a suture material to be there for too long inside the patient's mouth. Chromic cat cut is what you would want to use if you're using, going to use a natural uh, absorbable uh, material. Chromic cat cut is completely digested in 110 days, but in the oral cavity, its effective strength is up to five days. I have seen chromic cat cut resorb in about 14 days. So about two weeks is when I've seen it. Uh, some portion of it is remaining. I just snip it off or the patient comes and tells me that they have just pulled it off. The next would be the polyglycolic acid, or polyglactin, or as we like to call it, vitral sutures, used for alveolar mucosa, attached gingiva, large flaps where strength is required, but a resorbable suture is desired. Now, uh, at this point, let me give you my experience about where I would use a non-resorbable versus a resorbable. Again, it is coming ahead of the presentation, but at this point, I would just want you to, I want to mention that I would want a non-resorbable suture when I'm doing a GBR procedure where I want the sutures to stay in place until the healing is completed. And I'll go over which non-resorbable suture I'll be using. Also, another area where I would want to use a non-absorbable suture is where I want the patient to come back and see me. If I know a patient is flimsy and they're not going to come back, I want to make sure that I give a non-absorbable suture so that I have a chance for them to come back. I have a chance to take a look at the area and see the healing process. So uh, that is where I'd give it. Resorbable, I would give it under, uh, in soft tissue surgeries. Again, if you come uh, lower, uh, here you can also see polyglac 
lactic acid that is vital being given in the soft tissue surgeries. So under my flap, if I'm doing a connective tissue or a free general graft, I will give a resorbable suture so that I don't have to re-enter that site to remove those sutures. Monofilament nylon or polypropylene, all of those are good uh, where the strength is required. They are cutting needles, essentially non resorbable So the patient has to come back, has an excellent tissue reaction and strength. It's monofilament. That means it catches less of plaque. And finally, surgical silk can be used in any area, completely degraded by two years. We are not going to wait for that long. We are going to take it off much before that. Uh, traditional suture material used where strength is required. Its use has diminished. Now, if you in India, we still use a lot of silk, but abroad, the use of silk has diminished a lot. It has been replaced by what we call as EPTFE, Teflon, or the white field suture. Surgical thread materials, they range in diameter from one to 10. Higher the number, thinner the suture. Higher the number, more the magnification that is required to see them. In periodontal plastic surgery, we like to use a, a 5 -oh, 6 -oh, or a 7 -oh suture. In periodontal flaps or for flaps for implants, you want to use a 4 -oh suture and a mattress suturing 3 -oh and a 4 -oh. I personally believe that in dentistry, 3 -oh has no place. It's a big needle. You don't want to use it. 4 -oh is where you want to start uh, suturing in dentistry. So 4 -oh and above is what you're looking at uh, for suturing in dentistry. Now, these are the normal... Uh, things that we use. So in non-resorbable silk, we would like to use a 4-0 or a 5-0. In a nylon, it's a 5-0 or a 6-0. Polypropylene, a 6-0. And in an EPTFE or a Teflon, you want to use a 4-0 or a 5 -0. So these are the common suture sizes or threads that you'd want to use in your patients. Now let's try to understand what is written on a suture package. And these are single-use packages um, if you're using them. Please do not uh, reuse them. Please do not package them again and try to uh, sterilize them again and do that. These are single use sutures, okay? So if you look at it, uh, starting clockwise, we start with the needle shape. So if you look at the 12 o'clock position, you go down, it says 3 8 C, which means it's a 3 8 cutting needle. And I'll go through that uh, in the next few slides about what exactly that means. Then you have the manufacturer name, you have the brand name of the material, then you have the suture. Here it is made up of polyamide 6. Then you have an area where you can pick up the needle with your needle driver and pull it out. You then have the lot and expiration date. Please check that before you start using it, especially when you're using a resorbable suture material because it starts degrading over time. So you don't want to use something that is beyond expiration date. You then have your suture length, uh, which is about 18 inches here, uh, 45 centimeters. Uh, many a time you will find your silk sutures, the ethylon, ethylon sutures from uh, J&J are pretty long. They are almost about 90 centimeters long. So you want to maybe cut it in half and then use them. You then have an image of the needle. So here you can see the image of the needle, the 3 8 circle. You then have the needle type. Here it's a reverse cutting needle. You have the needle length, which is about 19 millimeters. Needle code here, PS2 means plastic surgery 2. So that is the, this is used in areas of plastic surgery. You have your metric gauge and of course your US gauge. So what we use when we call 504030 is the US gauge. So I hope this gives you an idea about uh, what you're looking at when you're looking at a single use suture package. Uh, this is somewhere where uh, we have it in India. So you can see on the uh, left-hand side, you have your Mersilk suture from Ethicon. You have a cutting needle, 16 millimeter needle length, 3 8 circle cutting. And the suture length is 90 centimeters. And it's a 4 -0. On the right hand side, you have a crow gut or what we call as a chromic cat gut, 3 8 circle, cutting needle, and 16 millimeters. And the suture length is about 76 centimeters. So you have the expiry date written on uh, that. Again, on the Mersilk silk suture, the expiry date is written on the other side. So these are all things that you would want to observe and read, especially when you have your uh, medical representatives coming to you and trying to sell you sutures. Look at these aspects before you buy into the sutures. Silk, most universally used, easy to use, ties well with a slip knot, very inexpensive. The disadvantage is being non-absorbable. And because silk is multi-filament, it pulls and retains bacteria and fluids. 
So when you see a patient after about a week, you can see this. The silk sutures have swollen up. They attract a lot of plaque. So that is the reason why you want to tell your patient to keep that area clean. Not with brushing, but with a good saline rinses. So make sure you tell your patient that we want to keep the area clean. We don't want bacteria to be attracted in the area and then seep into the flap under the flap. So you don't want that to happen. You have your polyester uh, made up of multi-filament braided into a single strand. Advantages, it does not weaken. When moist, it has a great tensile strength. The main disadvantage of polyester, it has a coating, which makes the knot security a problem. So because of the coating, it unties easily. And for all of you who use polyester clothes, we know how it slippery it is. So you can imagine if you use it for a suture, it will untie very easily. Proline, uh, one of my favorites in uh, using it for my soft tissue surgeries. It's a non-absorbable monofilament. It is better than nylon used in soft tissue closures. Uh, I use a 6O or a 7O proline. So again, as I mentioned, I use it with magnification and I'll show you a case where I have used it. EPTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene expanded. We used to call these as Gore-Tex sutures. Now, an interesting point here is the word Gore-Tex. It's actually a company that used to make jackets made up of this material called Teflon. So they started getting into suture materials as well. So the trade name, uh, just like how we call mineral water as bislary, the trade name remained and uh, it was called as a Gore-Tex suture. But now different companies, they had the trademark for the longest time. Uh, now different companies have come up with EPTFE sutures. So they are now widely known as EPTFE. They are a non-absorbable mono monofilament. They have a very high tensile strength, excellent handling properties, very good knot security, but it is expensive when compared to other non-absorbable sutures. So I like to use them during my GBR procedures to ensure that my flap is in place and then it stays there for about two weeks later when I can go and cut them off. Polyglactin vitral, uh, in cases where I don't have Teflon, again, I have a consulting practice where I go to different practices as well. So in some case, uh, places where I don't carry my Teflon or I don't have a Teflon, vitral is my go-to. It's a multi-filament absorbable suture made up of polyglycolic acid. It is hydrophobic, so it slows down the resorption over time. And it has a very good increased material tensile strength. Now, vitral comes in two uh, versions. One is the regular vital, which stays on the patient's mouth for at least about a month or sometimes even more, uh, can be irritating for the patient if it stays on for uh, such a long time. So there's something called as vital rapid, which stays on for about uh, two, two and a half weeks. So if you are someone who wants to have the suture resolved, completely resolved uh, within about two to three weeks, then you want to go for vital rapid, but something which you want for longer time periods, which I don't think is necessary, then the regular vital is for you. Uh, this is just a table, surgical silk uh, table ex uh, explaining what I just explained uh, in terms of the tissue reaction ease of handling and tensile strength. Again, uh, I mentioned this at the start, when do I use a resorbable versus a non-resorbable? Resorbable when you have a flap closing over. So if I am connecting a soft tissue, if I am placing a soft tissue graft in an area, I want to adapt that soft tissue onto the tooth or the implant with a resorbable suture and then close the flap over with a non-resorbable suture or a resorbable. But resorbable sutures, especially again, as I said, in case you have a patient who is traveling, please go ahead and use a resorbable suture because the patient may not come back to uh, get the sutures removed. But if in case you want to do a follow-up on your patient, then you can go ahead and use a non-resorbable suture. Again, Teflon is a very good material. Gore-Tex sutures are a very good non-resorbable sutures, which have a good tissue reaction. So you can use that uh, in terms of the non-resorbable. Start slowly moving away from silk. Uh, bacterial adherence. This is a uh, study that was done. Non-absorbable sutures have a greater bacterial adherence than resorbable sutures. Multifilament, of course, because of the multiple filaments that exist, can attract more bacteria than a monofilament. So that is something also... Uh, based on the patient's uh, plaque control, you want to decide what kind of sutures you want to give. Uh, needles, uh, I mentioned about three parts, point, body, and swage of the needle, uh, classified according to the curvature, radius, and shape. These are the different needles in dentistry. You have your 3 8 circle, used for most accessible intraoral sites, allows one passing from the facial to the lingual. 
And you have your half circle, which is used for more restricted areas, buckle of maxillary molars, periosteal and mucogingival surgeries. Half circle many a times can get lost underneath uh, between the contact points. So you want to use a castrovia or needle holder to pull it through. Again, magnification helps in this. You have your different needle designs, taper point suited to the soft tissue. It dilates rather than uh, kind of thick. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, there you go. Uh, reverse cutting, very sharp, ideal for the skin, uh, cuts rather than dilates. Okay, So taper point will uh, dilate more than cutting, whereas reverse cutting will cut rather than dilate. What we want to use is this. We want to use a reverse cutting. Uh, very rarely do we want to use a conventional cutting. The reason for the reverse cutting, if you look at the cross section, it's an inverted triangle. So towards the papilla, you have a flat area. So it does not pull through or pill through the papilla or the tissue. So that's the reason why you want to use a reverse cutting. Many suture materials are available in conventional cutting. It's very sharp, but you have to be very careful when you're using it. Uh, taper cutting, we rarely use that uh, in dentistry. So the mainly that we use are reverse cutting and conventional cutting. Okay, so I mentioned about reverse cutting being a smooth inner curvature, best for dentistry, avoid flaps from tearing, and a conventional cutting, easier to tear flaps, not to be used in routine oral surgeries. Okay, that's what happens when you use a conventional cutting needle. It pulls through the tissue. Suturing techniques, again, I'll just go through these suturing techniques. Simple loop, interrupted, we all know this. You go from the buckle, go from the lingual and suture it closed. Most commonly used, uh, nothing uh, specific about it. You want to use it for replacement of the flaps and sometimes for coronary reposition flaps as well. Crisscross suture used in extraction socket. It helps in containing the graft in the extraction socket. Especially if you're trying to do a site preservation in that area, you pack bone graft, you place a collagen membrane or a collagen plug. You want to use this so that it contains the graft in place. So this is the right way of uh, using a crisscross suture. Figure of eight technique. Again, this is used where you want the tissue to be uh, closed down or a position at a much lower height than where you started. So let's say you have taken away from bone of tabling in implant dentistry. You want the tissues to now lay down. This is what we'll be using. Turn the needle around. That pops the Then you pull it through and then it's on the buckle. So that's a figure of eight suture. Sling suture, when you're only reflecting one flap. So for example, when you're only reflecting Again, as when I do a you can see I'm passing it to the buckle. Underneath the contact point of the knee deal, I am trying to currently reposition the flap. So I want the flap to be pulled over. So I pass the suture under the contact. You can see how the tissue is being pulled over. And then again, I go to the under the contact and tie it up on the piston. Vertical mattress suture, it adapts tissue to the implant while averting the flap, resists flap tension from various muscle attachments. I don't commonly use a vertical mattress suture for implants. I use it when I'm doing grafting between teeth. Uh, again, uh, this is something that you usually do not use. Horizontal mattress, a very important suture, especially in implant dentistry. This is where you do not want your flap edges to have tension. So you want to give a horizontal mattress suture. So you enter from the buckle, pass it to the lingual, again, lingual, enter to the lingual and pass it again to the buckle. So it forms what we call as a loop around it. So that's horizontal mattress. So the flap edges 
have no tension and then you clip the flap edges with some interrupted sutures. So it takes the tension away from the flap edges. So this is an example. Uh, I have placed an implant, I've done a GBR, I have placed a membrane and I don't want any tension on the flap edges to open up. Whenever there's a, a tension at the flap edge, it opens up. So I don't want that to happen. So this is what I'm suturing. I've passed it to the buckle, passed it to the lingual. I turn it around, pass it to the lingual here again. You can see my membrane there. It also helps in stabilizing the membrane. So the suturing also helps to make sure the membrane is in place. And then you hold the buckle tissue. And now I have passed it through, so my tissue will now get You can see how I am now tying it up on the buckle. I'll just show you the end. And this is how it looks. And then the remaining edges of the flap, I use some interrupted switches. Again, as I mentioned, used for membrane stabilization as well. Here, what you see is what we call as a cytoplast suture. Uh, one of the main indications the company says is you can leave it exposed. I still do not try to take that risk. These are images, uh, of course, from the internet. But uh, I try not to take the risk. But this is how you stabilize a flap. Once you have given adequate amount of release on the flap, your membrane is stabilized with the horizontal matter suture, and then the flap is closed over, as you can see on the right-hand side. Continuous suture, uh, when you have large flap areas that you want to cover with a single uh, suture thread and single knot, this is what you would want to use. In a continuous suture, there are two types, continuous uh, suture and a continuous interlocking suture. So this is an example of a continuous interlocking suture. So I have opened up a large flap in the mandible. My first thing that I do is I just, I tie a knot as if it's an interrupted suture. So right here is my first knot. So I enter the tissue and I only cut the short end of the suture. The long end is still connected. I take this now and start going distal to the area that I sutured right here. Pierce to the lingual. I then pass this needle from under the loop that is formed. So that forms a locking mechanism. So here you can see, and I'm passing this from under the loop and then pulling it. So that locks the suture. So when I pull it, you can see that it forms a locking mechanism. There you go. So I just continue doing this. So I keep locking it. And finally, when I, sorry. Finally, when I, I have reached where I want to, I take the loop. So let me just uh, go back. Yeah, there you go. So what I do is the final loop that is there, that forms my other end of the suture. So I hold that loop with my needle holder and then tie the knot right there. So that forms my loop and that's my continuous suture. Another important suture is the periosteal suture uh, used again in stabilizing your membranes, also used in stabilizing your graft, your free general graft, your uh, soft tissue graft that you would place. A periosteal suture where the needle passes through the periosteum. Uh, so for this, you need to elevate a split thickness flap. You don't want to elevate a full thickness. You need to leave the periosteum on the bone and you pass your needle through the periosteum, uh, uh, periosteum and that helps in securing the suture. So again, can be used for membrane stabilization. So you can see here on the buckle, we have given a periosteal suture and on the lingual, we have passed through the palpable tissue and that helps keep the membrane in place. And over that, you have your flap closure. Now I want to... Uh, show you some two other suture materials, uh, su suture techniques before I bring this uh, webinar to a close. Uh, this is a fishing line suture. So for example, if you're doing a flapless implant placement, you want to augment the buckle area with just a soft tissue. 
you want to use what is called as a fishing line or a washing line suture. You have a connective tissue graft that you have taken. You pass the needle first from the apical portion of the implant area, bring it from under the socket, pass it where it says two, pass it through the three point, and then take it back in four and pull the entire tissue. So this area moves up and you suture it close in the apical extent. This way, you're not reflecting a flap. You are preventing any amount of bone loss that can happen. But in the same time, you're also augmenting the tissue. This also helps in augmenting tissue in areas where the implant is already placed. The patient comes to you because of a thin tissue. So you want to do that where you pull the tissue up to a tunnel that you have created in that area. This is how it looks uh, seven day post-op. And then on the right hand side, you can see once it's completely healed. Holding sutures, very important in coronally repositioned flaps. So this is a patient who came in uh, for some uh, recession of the anteriors. And on the right hand side, you can see how she looked after it healed. But in between these two pictures, this is what the patient had. So I currently pulled the tissues down. I gave her some sutures which were held on to place with composite bonded onto the tooth. So that helped in making sure the tissue stayed in place. And I removed these sutures two weeks hence so that the once the tissues had started the healing process and I had no risk of the tissue being pulled back again. Suturing an FGG, this was a patient who came to us uh, with an implant on the second premolar, but the first premolar showed recession. And you can see there is no keratinized gingiva at all. It's just mucosa. I wanted to make sure that this does not affect the tooth next or the implant next door. So I want to do a free gingival graft in this area. So this is where I sutured in place. You can see the graft is sutured with some interrupted sutures. And then I used a periosteal suture. So you can see here if I can. Take it here and pause it in this place right here. So you can see what we did. I used a periosteal bite in the apical extent of the graft and then gave a sling suture around so my graft was held in place. So this is where you would want to use a periosteal suture. And this is a four year follow up. You can see a good recession coverage with some uh, good keratinous tissue. And my implant is also happy next door. This is a suturing a CT graft. Again, same thing for tooth and implants. The patient came in with some severe recession. I won't spend time going through the entire video. I think uh, uh, the next webinar is about talking to laughing in the history. So I'm just going to show you how I would suture right here. So I place uh, this here we use an artificial graft and I give interproximal sutures. I've used a vital suture in this case. So I make sure that interproximally I secure the graft. Once I secure the graft in place, I then go ahead and close my tissue up. Right there. I'm closing my tissue with some interproximal sling sutures here. I'm trying to pull down and giving some sling sutures because I have not reflected the new plant yet. So this is how it will look. And at the end of the procedure, the patient uh, goes home and then four months later, the patient comes like this. Now, if you observed in the previous video, I used very thin sutures. I probably used a 6 so suture. The reason being, this also helps in reducing the scar tissue formation or track lines, suture track lines that we see many a times. So if you look at this image, again, four months later, there's not much of track lines, probably some seen because of the vertical incision mesial to the canine, but I don't see much of the suture track lines. So that is the reason where, why you should use smaller sutures and magnification, which will help in reducing the scar tissue formation in your patients. Uh, suture knot, a surgeon's knot, again, uh, everyone knows this. You uh, Again, each one has their own uh, way of uh, doing it. I do a two, two forward, one reverse, two forward. Uh, each one to his own. Uh, this is something uh, that everyone has an opinion on. So please feel free to use anything, but make sure your knot is secure. What about suture removal? Use a disinfecting mouthwash to remove all the debris off the wound. So if you want to use a mouthwash in a monoject syringe, please do that. Elevate the suture knot uh, with some pliers or tweezer and then cut the suture off. If you want, a tip I can give you is use some topical anesthetic before you do that so that the patient does not feel the pain of you pulling it. So topical anesthetic or a topical spray where you're using uh, or where you're trying to get the suture off. 
cut the sutures as close to the knot as possible. Seven to 10 days for silk sutures because they have a wicking effect, as I mentioned. The wicking effect means they have a tendency to attract the bacteria. And two weeks and later for all other suture materials. Some FAQs, uh, if uh, again, I don't know if these are the questions that will come up, but I but I'll put them in here. Do I re-suture an area if the flap opens up? Again, in case your flap is healing with secondary intention, please try not to re-suture, just leave it. Ask the patient to keep that area clean with some chlorhexidine rinses or chlorhexidine dipped in a Q-tip or an earbud and then gently applied over the area. But in case your flap has completely opened up, bare bone is visible, then yes, you need to uh, re what I call as re-energize the wound. You need to have the blood supply come back again. So probably try to create some bleeding in the area and suture it again if the flap is open a lot. Uh, I already mentioned about how to avoid track marks and suture scars. Try to use magnification, try to use smaller suture uh, needles and uh, threads. So basically we are using, we're talking about a 506070 oh, oh, sutures. Uh, this is one of my professors from North Carolina, Dr. Harley Ellinger. Every single time I suture, I remember him because he said these words. He said, suturing can go on until the extent of your imagination. And that is so true. Uh, you also can experience it when you're suturing. You probably will keep looking at him saying, okay, maybe one more suture here, maybe one more there. And for those of you who are PG students, your PG guide probably will come by and see, look at it and say, okay, I think one more there or one more here. So suturing can go on until the extent of your imagination. You can keep suturing until you feel comfortable. You think that you have a good amount of flap closure. You can keep on suturing. Uh, I hope to see all of you uh, 26th to 28th November in Kochi. I uh, am conducting a course there, hands-on on GBR, as well as I'll be giving a lecture on uh, uh, complications related to GBR and uh, uh, GBR in general. So I hope to see all of you there. Uh, you can register now. You can scan this QR code and get yourself registered. We have a, we have tons of speakers from India as well as from around the world. So uh, I'm looking forward to a great, great meeting in uh, November in Kochi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, spending your time with me on this Sunday morning. Uh, this is our team. Uh, we call ourselves the Perio family because we are three periodontists in the family. My father, my wife, um, and of course, yours truly. Uh, my email address is periofamily at gmail.com. I am available on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I use Instagram a lot. Uh, you can follow me on Perio family. I try to post my cases uh, there on that. I also have a YouTube channel. You can look for uh, Dr. Akshay Kumar Swami on YouTube. I post long videos on YouTube uh, related to implant and uh, periodontal surgeries. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Aditi, for uh, uh, moderating this session. I am open to questions if there are any. Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure. And we already follow you on Instagram and on YouTube. And your you know stories and snippets are a great deal of learning. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we take up some questions, sir? Sure. Okay. Uh, sir, what's your opinion on re-suturing a dehiscence wound uh, due to uh, slippage of sutures? Good. So I, I kind of anticipated a question then. <laughs> okay. So let me repeat what I said. So if in case you have a wound that has a dehiscence, there are two ways about it. In case the dehiscence has opened up only in the crestal portion, so you can just see it opening up right in the crestal portion. I would not do anything. I would, again, as I said, just ask the patient to make sure they're keeping the wound clean with some good saline rinses, chlorhexidine, mouthwashes, and earbuds or Q-tips dipped in chlorhexidine and gently rubbed in that open area for at least about two to three times a day for three to four weeks. That will help in making sure there's no infection in the site and it will help in secondary intention healing of that area. So always make sure that you want to use, uh, 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 you want to suture only wounds that are completely opened up. Then yes, as I mentioned, you want to recreate bleeding in that area. You want to get some uh, blood supply in the area and then try to suture that area. Understood. So I hope the question is well answered. And uh, there is another question that says that we suture the buccal and the lingual flap. So should that suturing be edge to edge or there should be an overlap? Good question. Now, usually you want it edge to edge, okay? You do not want it overlap unless the only time where you would want to use an overlap is when you have a sinus opening, okay? When you have a, what we call as an oroantral fistula. So when you have that, you want the flaps to be over one over the other. 
okay your buccal flap will be over your lingual flap will be under on the maxilla but other than that try as much as possible to be as edge to edge as possible even if you overlap a little there is no harm but you want to make sure your flap edges have some bleeding so that the overlapping takes place because many a times what happens your overlapping uh, thing your area your edge of the flap may have already healed and that blood supply is not there so you want to freshen up the wound in that overlap scenario freshen up the wound on the lingual or the buccal and then if you want to overlap that's fine but too much of overlap uh, should not be there that certainly clears up a lot of concepts thank you sir and another question says that uh, which side should the suture not be suture not always on the buccal always on the buccal two things ease of removing the suture for you also the patient's tongue is not going on the palate or the lingual so if you give it on the lingual the patient's tongue will constantly go there and they'll harm the surgical site so suture not always on the buccal understood so the type of sutures for the lip or the skin Oh. <laughs> tough, uh, tough question. I would uh, leave this question to an oral surgeon. Uh, again, I usually, uh, thankfully, do not have to deal with the outer lip or the outer skin. I do not want to tell you anything uh, wrong. So I would not want to answer that question because I don't deal much with the outer lip or the skin. But uh, in the very few cases, and I have done some uh, um, cases on the inner border of the lip, I've used your uh, regular chromic gut or my vital in those areas. But uh, outer lip, I haven't, uh, skin, I haven't done much. Thank you. The next question says the best suture material and uh, technique for suturing, you know, around implants. I think for that, we have to repeat the entire webinar. I, I know. Yeah. The, the thing is, uh, uh, here, I think uh, the question is about immediate implant placement following extraction. Now, immediate implant placement following an extraction, I usually tend to only suture the papillas. And I try to use the smallest amount of suture possible. Two points uh, why I do that. Number one, immediate implants usually are in the anterior zone. You do not want scar in that area. You want, uh, don't want a, a suture track in that area. So that is the reason why I use the thinnest suture. So probably a 6050 uh, vital or uh, uh, something of that sort. And you want to make sure that you are going to immediately temporize that area. So the suture comes off as soon as you temporize. Many a times, you may not even need to suture because if you are going to do an atraumatic extraction, your papillas are in place. So you may not even need to suture immediate implant extraction sites. Understood, sir. So what's your take on Blue M oral gel over the sutured areas and soft tissues? Uh, I have not used it, but I've heard a lot about the Blue M oral gel. Uh, again, no harm in using it. I, have, I believe that it can uh, give a good... Uh, uh, area for good healing in that area so if you are going to use a uh, i think they probably use uh, something with oxidation stress and reduces that that's how the mechanism works so uh, yeah you can go ahead and do that if you want to use a periodontal pack over your uh, area you can do that as well anything to protect your wound and sutures understood so a couple of more questions sir do sutured adhesives or sutured tapes have anything to do in the oral cavity uh, good question uh yes i have used uh some of these gels that have come in but uh they don't stay for long the problem is uh they open up uh, much sooner than you would want to and especially in implant dentistry uh gbr techniques that i do i want my flaps to be a position for a longer time so that is the reason why i don't use that i still uh, depend on my suture uh, materials if i am doing let's say uh, if any of you are doing any uh, minor flap surgery where you're just opening at the papilla to remove some amount of calculus then you can use any of these but for longer larger implant procedures gbr procedures please go ahead and use a suture on i think they can better be used as adjuncts correct yes so one last question uh, we mentioned we discussed something about periosteal suturing so what type of sutures are better suited for that? Absorbable or non-absorbable? Periosteal sutures, absorbable are better because uh, many a times what happens, those are the areas where you're not going to revisit to remove the suture. So periosteal sutures should be absorbable and of a thinner diameter as much as possible. So again, 60, 70, uh, 50, 60, 70 are the sutures that you're looking at for your periosteal suture and absorbable. Thank you, sir. So for G, uh, GBR procedures, is there a special suturing technique that we should follow? Horizontal matter suture. 
you want your flap edges to have no tension at all. So the main two points that I usually mention uh, when I'm teaching GBR, you want to have a good amount of flap release, which means a periosteal release. The flap is loose enough so that you are pulling it over the grafted area and then you're giving horizontal mattress sutures so that the flap edges do not have any tension. So always keep these two points in mind. A good flap release is important for GBR and horizontal mattress suturing. Thank you so much. I think that answers. Okay, one last question. Uh, okay, they want to see it. Uh, you can always refer to the YouTube video. This webinar will always be available on YouTube in case you want to go around. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, sir. I think our audience made you know a well use of this session with you. It was very intense and yet very interesting session of learning. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. I hope to see all of you in Kerala. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Right. And happy Ganesh Chaturthi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wishing all of you the same.